Muchas gracias para invitarme, porque en alguna manera invito. Thank you very much for inviting me, because uh, by inviting me, well, it's somewhat uh, strange uh, to uh, talk about children at a world conference. Adults uh, discuss, study, and write about uh, but, uh, the children never appear. During this uh, presentation, I'm going to try uh, to uh, include the children, and I'll dedicate uh, a significant part of my presentation to the things they have to say. And secondly, I would like to thank the organization that in uh, summarizing my presentation in the program, uh, where uh, the theme is shown, uh, they uh, talk about, uh, thought about cities. Uh, I uh, didn't dare go that far, and uh, I enjoyed it when I saw that uh, uh, the organizers uh, thought uh, that uh, when you get children uh, to uh, think about a city, it becomes a thought-out city, which means that uh, when you don't do that, it isn't a thought-out city. I agree with that, but I didn't dare go that far. Uh, we'll start uh, with... Uh, what is a city? And the first uh, definition I found is a definition almost uh, two centuries uh, BC, and we find it in the book of Zacharias, uh, who says that Jerusalem will be called uh, the uh, city of fidelity. Old men and women will sit uh, in the squares, uh, each uh, holding their walking stick. The squares of the city will be full of boys and girls playing. The city identifies uh, with a square, and the square is uh, the meeting place, the meeting place between generations. And uh, they will be uh, full of boys and girls playing. Reading uh, this uh, reminded me of an interview with our great architect, Renzo Piano. And he said to the journalist that was interviewing him, we, thinking about uh, architects and town planners, are not worthy of our ancestors because we have surrounded our cities, our historical and beautiful Italian cities, with uh, ugly peripheries like all peripheries in the world. And to describe how ugly the peripheries uh, are, he says they have no squares. Today, uh, squares uh, are not uh, full of old men and women and uh, boys and girls playing. They're full of cars. The point is uh, that uh, cities developed uh, in a very interesting way, and uh, I say this because I want to move on uh, the thinking of children very soon, but uh, cities uh, were born rejecting the idea of the medieval castle. The castle was uh, a strong uh, structure that was separated by a moat, a bridge, the walls, and uh, the city started uh, with the uh, rich inside, the poor outside, the peasants, uh, the craftsmen that uh, worked for the castle. When the city was born, this uh, pattern uh, broke down, and uh, the city was born around a square. The square included the government palace, the cathedral, and the market. This uh, is uh, the point of exchange. And another very important point uh, at the heart of our reflections is uh, that the city is beautiful because of its diversity. The uh, city doesn't have uh, different neighborhoods for rich and poor. It uh, wasn't thought out uh, with the idea of uh, zoning 
as our architects say. The uh, historic city is beautiful. The palaces of the noblemen of the rich designed by great architects grew up next uh, to the humble homes uh, of the artisans and uh, this made it beautiful. By this, I'm not saying that it's a fair city. The rich were rich, perhaps richer than today. The poor uh, were poor, probably poorer than today, but they lived together. The uh, post-war city goes back uh, to uh, an ancient model, when after the Second World War, uh, cities have had to be rebuilt because they were destroyed. They had to uh, choose how and who for and for reasons I can't explain. It seems uh, that uh, they uh, chose uh, to rebuild them for uh, some people and not for everyone. Choosing a, a protagonist citizen, a strong citizen, that we uh, describe as an adult working male. The services were uh, thought out for them. The territory was planned. The cities uh, were built for them, including the peripheries. Uh, recovering uh, this uh, medieval uh, uh, model of uh, the uh, medieval inner city and the peripheries are worse than that. We have uh, created a city for us. But of course, if uh, the city is based on a male working uh, adult, it will be very uncomfortable or even exclusive uh, for uh, males that are not adults and uh, that don't work. And uh, this makes up most of the population that's uh, left aside, excluded. They uh, disappear. If we uh, walk uh, through a city, it will be uh, very hard to find under 10 years of age uh, out uh, alone because they need to go out with their friends, uh, explore the environment and live uh, adventures uh, as we did during our childhood. And it's also difficult to, to uh, find people that move around alone or very elderly people. And this means that it's a hostile city. I read something in uh, Pope uh, Francis's recent where uh, he says, Today uh, we see, for example, the enormous and disorderly growth of many cities that have become unhealthy to live in, not uh, just because of uh, the uh, pollution caused by the toxic emissions, but also because of the urban chaos, the transport problems, and the uh, visual and acoustic uh, contamination. Many uh, cities have inefficient structures uh, that uh, use uh, excessive energy and water. There are neighborhoods that, although uh, built recently, are congested and disorderly without uh, sufficient green areas. It's not suitable for inhabitants of this planet to uh, live more and more covered by cement asphalt, uh, a glass and metal, deprived of physical contact with nature. It was uh, worth uh, waiting uh, to hear these words from our politicians uh, and not just from the Pope. We hope they'll listen. This somewhat sad uh, part, uh, there's something even sadder. If uh, uh, we think about the environment and the way we treat the environment as if uh, we were uh, the last of the inhabitants uh, without uh, uh, children and grandchildren, and if we think about the uh, economic situation, about the political crisis, about how inequality is increasing between the rich the uh, rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer in spite uh, of everything that has been promised. 
in spite of publicly uh, rejecting in our laws and uh, democratic constitutions uh, war, uh, we uh, still make war. And uh, I always uh, quote this with a great deal of embarrassment, especially considering that I have a seven-year-old. The uh, recent uh, scientific uh, figures uh, show that those uh, that uh, come afterwards, after us, will have a shorter life expectancy than us. And this is terrible, because it has never happened before in the history of humankind. Compared to our uh, grandparents, not our remote ancestors, uh, we live almost 10 years more. And now we're... Uh, heritage and children themselves uh, denounce this seven Suzuki is a, a Canadian uh, girl 12 years old who in 1992 at the uh, Rio summit uh, represented the children of the world she ended uh, uh, her uh, presentation with these words parents ought to be able to comfort their children saying uh, it will be taken care of. It's not the end of the world. We're doing the best we can. But uh, I don't think uh, that uh, you can say it anymore. What uh, you're doing make me cry at night. And a uh, girl from the Council of Children in Rosario, Argentina, a 10-year-old girl, said it in a different way, almost a more political way. She said... Uh, are to blame for everything. Limits have to be set for adults. The thing is uh, that uh, cities are very hard on children. They're very hard on children because they can't leave home. This has changed. Uh, we were able to go out. Things are different now. And uh, they're paying a very high price. And I'll say this quickly. A child that cannot leave the house it cannot play. And the parents say, well, what are you saying? Uh, we uh, take them to the park every day. And uh, we buy them a lot of toys. Well, that's the reason. You uh, can't uh, accompany uh, a child to play. The verb play doesn't uh, conjugate with the verb accompany uh over control because it has to do with pleasure therefore it has to be conjugated only with leave it's complicated but uh, that's how it is and the same uh, for toys you don't uh, buy uh, playing just because they own a lot of toys it doesn't mean they're like children. to uh, play properly they need a few uh, good toys and friends and uh, time to do it. If they can't leave home without an adult, they cannot uh, discharge their physical energy the way they need. We have all these uh, courses, uh, dancing, football, I don't know what. I'm not saying it's useless, but it's not uh, enough. Children need uh, a moment every day to be free to move, to be able to do things with their friends uh, and uh, outside direct control. Pediatricians uh, say this. What are the dangers? Uh, children's uh, obesity on the one hand and affection disorders. And uh, this uh, is uh, causing uh, an enormous pharmacological impact on children. If children can't leave home without adults, they cannot uh, live the experience of risk. Adults say, uh, well, of course, we accompany them on purpose so that they won't run risks. But uh, risk is necessary, fundamental for growth. An obstacle is a fundamental element in development. And if they cannot uh, live uh, the experience of... Uh, surmounting obstacles of doing um, silly things when they need to, they will accumulate a desire that will 
explode in adolescence. Many of what we think are uh, dangers or problems in adolescence, such as uh, alcohol and drug abuse, uh, bullying, uh, motorbike accidents, even uh, children's uh, suicide, I think are connected uh, to this issue of the, the uh, profound and almost complete reduction in children's autonomy. A uh, five-year-old boy from a city near Reggio Miglia says if adults uh, don't listen to children, they're going to uh, run into a big trouble. And uh, I was greatly impressed by this. Uh, he's five years old. Uh, what does he know about big trouble? But uh, we do know about it. Children have this uh, prophetic uh, capability to uh, reveal... Uh, strange things we're doing without realizing it, apparently. Well, we come to listening to children. Why is it worth uh, listening to children? Because uh, children are capable. Science helped us understand this, uh, and we're hearing it here uh, in all the presentations. But our uh, maestros, uh, uh, Freud, Piaget, Bikowski, Bruner, helped us uh, to understand that the most important years in life are the early years and that uh, children are capable of expressing their opinion. And uh, this was taken on in 1998 uh, by the uh, Convention of the Rights of Children where there's an article that is impressive from my point of view, Article 12, that says uh, children have uh, the right to express uh, their opinion every uh, time uh, decisions are made that affect them. When I read it the first time, I couldn't believe it. I said, is it possible that adults uh, promise so much? Because uh, it, it means that in 1989, not just anywhere, not uh, in uh, uh, a neighbor's association or said by a philosopher, or uh, kind people that have uh, utopian ideas about the future. No. At the highest level of world politics, the United Nations, the adults of the world promise to the children of the world that from this time on, they will uh, not uh, make uh, another decision that uh, affects them without consulting. An impressive uh, promise and a complete lie. Because uh, uh, practically nothing has been done about this. Many of the articles in the Convention are being worked on, especially uh, defense, uh, protection, without reaching the expected outcome. But uh, at least they are concerned with them. But these articles uh, that uh, recognize the citizenry of children since 1989, it's... Uh, legitimate to say you are the future of our society. You are future citizens. No, citizen, children are citizens today. Small citizens, but citizens. This changes everything. Or it should change everything. With this attitude, we uh, advise uh, mayors in our project we advise them to uh, ask uh, children for their point of view. And now we uh, move into the world of children, how children uh, see cities, uh, what they say. And I'm going to analyze a number of uh, proposals that uh, out from the uh, participation of children with the city governments, what we called children's councils councils that have nothing to do with adult councils. In these uh, almost 25 years' experience, we have uh, tried to uh, work with adult councils, children councils, 
schools uh, to work uh, with a new experience, with full respect for the democratic, democratic bodies of the city, of course, and the world of education on the other. But in the council, we propose children are uh, elected by uh, drawing their names. In other words, uh, they, it's not based on merit. Uh, they are not uh, the politicians of the future. A draw is made of boys and girls in the same number. There may is a different point of view. And it's worthwhile uh, listening to it because it's different. Not because uh, they know a great deal. Not because they know more than us. It would be ridiculous to think that. But because of their diversity. And again, uh, we go back to diversity as a value. I think this is something we always need to bear in mind. Giovanni, a boy from Lofano, where this experience started many years ago, in 1991, was 10 years old. And one day he says, I didn't believe this thing about the council. I didn't believe that adults uh, were really willing to listen. And then I realized that they uh, really did listen. And at that moment, I felt responsible, 10 years old. And I thought he was going to say, I felt proud, I felt recognized, happy. No, responsible. Almost uh, like saying, uh, from uh, this time on, I've had to think carefully about what I'm going to propose, because uh, they may do it. Federico, a 10-year-old uh, boy, from uh, the Council of uh, Children of Rome said uh, to the mayor, I ask uh, this city permission to leave home. Uh, very uh, peculiar uh, request. Everybody knows, and so does Federico, that uh, they can only uh, ask uh, their uh, parents uh, for uh, permission for this, and only their parents can give permission. But Federico uh, knows uh, that uh, his mother and father will say, no, you can't go out because the city doesn't allow it. So uh, he uh, coherently uh, goes to the mayor and says, G give me permission to leave home. And I think that this is a political proposal. That uh, uh, can uh, take on by uh, asking itself, how can I uh, think out a city so that the uh, Federicos of the city can leave home? Because uh, they don't know uh, the uh, difficulties uh, in the city. The difference between uh, Federico and his parents is profound. The diagnosis is similar. The city is dangerous. But his parents say the uh, city is uh, dangerous. Uh, and therefore, you can't go out. And if you do, we will accompany you and uh, possibly go by car. Federico says uh, the city is dangerous. Uh, therefore, it has to be checked. That's why it's worthwhile working with children. There's a phrase uh, that uh, I like very much, which is uh, hope has two uh, beautiful doors. To rage and courage rage uh, before the state of things and the courage uh, to change them. It's not from your uh, students at Puerta del Sol or the uh, election program of Podemos. It's from St. Augustine. Rage and courage. This is the uh, heritage uh, that uh, children uh, can use uh, to help us change cities. But let's move on. A boy from Fano protests in front of the uh, municipal council because after one year's work, the uh, children meet uh, with the mayor and uh, the council to present uh, their opinions, uh, their complaints, uh, their petitions. And he says, I was playing in the square and a policeman uh, took my ball away. This child is uh, complaining about uh, something that had affected him. And we, who work with the children, help uh, the city politicians uh, to understand that this boy is right, that the policeman made a mistake. 
because he violated Article 31 of the Convention of the Rights of Children, which is an Italian law, as it is a Spanish law and a law in all uh, countries in the world, except one, the United States, for a very complicated issue, because uh, they have the uh, death penalty uh, for... Uh, children under 18 years of age in some states and cannot sign the convention. But the convention was signed by all countries in the world. It's the most widely recognized of all international laws. And Article 31 says that children have the right to play. And therefore, a policeman cannot disturb a child that's playing. They have to defend them because they are exercising a right. And uh, regarding uh, playing, a child from the same city asks uh, for uh, a uh, football pitch uh, without a coach. Children are fed up with us. Children today can study football, but they can't play with a ball. And it's not the same thing. They say, please, uh, give me a football pitch without a coach. But if we are interested in analyzing these uh, thoughts in much greater depth, what we can see is that behind there is a proposal. And this is our role. Because uh, children uh, give us clues and they apply strokes. Uh, we cannot wait for them to prepare a program for us. But with these elements or with this aid, we can construct a, an alternative political proposal because a little girl says that adults, adults what they do is uh, plant, well, they use these flower, pot, flower pots, sorry. They plant them in the gardens so that children cannot play. And this is a very harsh interpretation as if adults, especially in this particular garden model, which are called Italian-style gardens, as if they were to carry out specific actions to prevent children from playing. But in this case, if we analyze this in somewhat greater depth, we have to recognize that they are completely right. So, what are the main features of an Italian-style garden? They have a boulevard, they have benches, and uh, flower pots. So, in other words, or flower boxes. So, in other words, that's where people go for walks, uh, to sit down, and to admire the landscape, which is uh, which are the three things that children do not do. They do not go out for walks, and they do not stop to sit down, and they're not interested in contemplating nature as we adults would like saying how wonderful, etc. So these are gardens that are not for children. But let's focus a little bit more specifically on what we are doing for them, that is on gardens for children, in other words with the swings and slides painted in lively colors that you can see from a distance, because that's where a child from the north of Italy wrote a letter to the mayor and in it she said dear mayor the benches in the garden are placed the wrong way around but why is it that they're looking inwards or why are they face when i go there with my grandfather my grandfather keeps an eye whilst i play and i don't like that at all and once again we believe that um, games are like a pleasant experience and if we think if we were to think about our pleasures well they are not very compatible with the idea of surveillance uh, control or assistance and at least under no normal circumstances and uh, mm, but neither does my grandfather like a lot because as he's a very curious guy he enjoys uh, looking at the street and this is a very interesting observation from this child, because we know that benches are not placed the wrong way round, but rather they were placed like that on purpose, so that we can keep an eye on our children whilst they play. 
in the garden. And it's also boring for the adults too, because they they take turns. Well, look, tomorrow you can go because I was there today, blah, blah, blah. So therefore, uh, games are not that uh, much fun. So the Council of Children of Rosario was uh, discussing with me, um, well, there was a, we were having a very a heavy discussion on the issue of safety, which is one of the biggest issues that affects, uh, the, uh, that affects children a lot in cities. And the issue was that they wanted to uh, go out like any other child, but the city was truly dangerous, not like when we say our cities are dangerous, no, which is not the case. But children there um, undergo attacks. They are attacked frequently. They are stopped by other boys, uh, somewhat older boys, and they uh, put a pen knife on their neck to steal their watches and their backpacks. And this is what the students' council told me. It's different compared to when people say, oh, I heard that. It's completely different when somebody gives you a first-hand testimony. And I thought that here we could produce a number of ideas. And the first thing that uh, came up was what always happens whenever we talk to children. And I would like to digress a little bit here, but normally when we say, When you ask, how do you listen to children, most people think that it's easy, and it's all about asking what you think about such an issue. And children don't uh, say what they think. No, I'm afraid that they do not say what they think, but they say what we think. From the very young ages, the, what they learned is that the best thing they can do with an adult, both at home and at school, is give back to the adults what they, the adults, are thinking, because adults and trust and hope that children will leave behind their attitudes and thoughts as children and move into a more of an adult sphere. And what they try to do, what a child tries to do, is to repeat whatever an adult says, and if they can do with more or less the same words. We know that, uh, pedagogically speaking, it's something that uh, is not that good, but this happens frequently in our daily lives. So children learn how to not trust their thoughts. So when we ask them to think, well, the first thing they try to do, the first thing they try to do is uh, demonstrate that they are not asleep, that they are alive and kicking, that they are in this world, that they do watch television, that they know what we think. So therefore, vis-a-vis uh, -vis this issue of what has to be done is for children, for the children in Rosario to be able to go out, well, this is when the usual proposals came out. In other words, we need to have more police officers, we need to have more video cameras on the streets, and we need adults to accompany us, to give us their support. Until one of the youngest uh, children raises his hand and says, no, I think that adults, I think that adults should help us, but from far away. And this changes absolutely everything. And this is something that I have seen, not because I prefer this, but firstly because I know Thing that uh, was not mentioned by an adult, because adults, what they say is always very near. And they say, don't uh, stand away from me, hold my hand. It's difficult for adults to pursue this idea. But of course, this sentence by this child, it could be updated as a political proposal, but what does it mean to help children from far away? What it possibly means you are taking on a role as a citizen, a different kind of role. So, in other words, uh, creating a welcoming room atmosphere, an environment uh, where there's lots of sensitivity that is participative, that is responsible.
And this means that we'd have to change the uh, neighborhood. So this is why when we propose this, ask the shop owners to open up their shops and to offer their services from the perspective so that they can use the toilet or so they can drink some water if something or, or they can be given an elastoplast if they need one. So in other words, assisting the children this is required. So in other words, we have to help them, but from far away. And in another case, I came across um, Children's Council in the north of Italy. And the children, well, I'm afraid that I had to um, speak to them without really knowing them. So tomorrow I'm going to be meeting up with your mayor. If there's anything that you have that is a concern or something that doesn't work well or something that you don't like of this city, we can write to him and tomorrow I will uh, submit it to the mayor. And due to uh, reasons that are somewhat difficult to understand, they started to talk about two car parks. Here, well, there are very few spaces where to park. And I said, well, why are you interested in that? Because you don't have a car. And they explained it perfectly well, as I before. Because no, when Daddy comes uh, home in the evening, he's always nervous because he can't park the car. So this obviously means that the children were representing the interests of the adults. But a one of the youngest uh, children and I'm not sure if you've uh, seen this, but there's always a one of the children. Normally, it's one of the youngest children, one of the smallest ones. And he raised his hand and said that this is something we've been expecting. There's always a very strong relationship and a very passionate relationship between the expectations and the attitudes of the children. Because raised his hand and said, I do not agree, because I believe that in this city, contrary to what we believe, there are too many places for cars to park. And why are you interested in this if you don't have a car in your family? No, I'm interested in this, because if there are too many spaces to park, it means that there's not enough room for us children to be able to play. Once again, I give value to this proposal, and not because I prefer it or like it more, but rather because, once again, because this can convince me that I think that in Italy there's not a single adult that believes that in their city there are too many parking spaces. So he constructed this on his own. And I think that this produced a very big motivation in the child because he said if there are too many spaces for cars, children will not have enough room to play in. And when I... So what is your proposal then? And he thought about it for a couple of minutes. Look, uh, tell the mayor that uh, I'll go for half those parking spaces. In other words, that we share the space. Half of the space for the cars and half of the space for the and, of course, I submitted this proposal to the mayor, and the adults that listened to me laughed, and I got angry. And I got angry because I said, look, this is a serious proposal. It's one of the proposals that you can take with you uh, and apply it to town planning, because when we have a space, well, we shouldn't be using more than half that space for cars. And you must bear in mind that this uh, child is making, uh, I don't know how to say this, it's a, a, a practically a shameful proposal because he's telling us that he wants to be uh, treated like a car. At least treat me like a car. Please uh, show me the same amount of respect. And we laugh and we think that this will never be possible while we think about the space involved. But in any case, what we are telling our children and our grandchildren that uh, we are worth less than cars, at least in practice. And in Buenos Aires, we address the issue of public spaces a lot, and I'm going to um, finish very quickly now. But I would like to finish with a number of remarks. And children uh, say that they, a space to be good for the children has to be a shared space. 
which is very strange, isn't it? Us. So children don't like uh, separation. They prefer pollution and diversity. And it's a very interesting concept because the spaces that are set aside for children are strange spaces. Uh, they're unsafe spaces because children are always there with somebody else. And these are spaces that are used for a very short period of time. At 8 o'clock in the evening, everybody leaves. And they become the place where the drug addicts go. People that want to destroy things go there. Because they don't belong to anybody. These are not really uh, true places. These are not offered to the general population. So what is somebody going to do there? Somebody might uh, think that, well, he might want to go and read a newspaper or a book in a park for children that is uh, full of noise, that's very dusty. Well, I wouldn't really want to have that option. So these are uh, strange spaces. They are mistaken spaces. And there's a major confusion here. We believe that children don't know how to play. And we have to tell the children how they are supposed to play and what games are all about. And we say that playing has to do with a slide. It has to do with a swing. And, uh, well, whatever, a uh, castle or whatever. And all of these things are extremely poor. Those people that designed these spaces, it seems that they were never children, or perhaps they forgot what it was like when they were children. And, well, the children in Buenos Aires say that there should be no railings, that there should be no police, and it's much better to be there without your parents being present. And then there's something else that they've also noticed, and this is a little girl living in Barcelona who said that spaces for children are always horizontal. And it's true. It's true because the first thing that a does is uh, what they do is they get in touch with one of these uh, firms that has bulldozers and they bulldoze the area. But do children like it nice and flat? No. Well, but if it is flat, we can control children better, say the adults. And the child says, well, if it's flat, we cannot, uh, they cannot hide. And hiding is a very important element for children's games and for traditional games too. And they say they always install the same games and the same slides, and I'm not trying, and it's not fun. It's like watching the same film every day. There are no surprises involved. So, in other words, well, there's no surprise factor involved. So, we, well, we want bushes, bushes so that we can kiss each other hiding behind the bushes because games have to do with all of these things. And in the spaces for children, this is something that is never taken into consideration. But what I think is a much more interesting, and what I think that is also difficult to understand, and which I believe has to be looked into in much greater depth, is what uh, Javier from Buenos Aires says. And he says that in order to have fun, we have to feel, feel too safe. So a space for children should not be a space that is too safe. He doesn't say that it shouldn't be safe, but it doesn't have to be too safe. So if it's too safe, what is it I'm going to do there? That's the question. And this reminds us what Francois Dondot, a wonderful French neuropsychiatrist, said once upon a time to a journalist. And she asked, what is it when you play with a child? I think it's about uh, fulfilling your wishes through risk. And once again, risk becomes a game element or a playful element. But I would like to finish the presentation with an example for you. So we ask the question, and if we were to listen to children, what would happen in a city? Two years ago, after many years, I went back to Pontevedra in Spain, 
And for those of you that are not from here, it's a city in Galicia. Galicia is the northwestern part of Spain over Portugal, where they speak Galician. And I'd like to say a couple of important things about Galicia. I was taken from the airport to the conference center. I hadn't seen anything on the way. And the mayor who was present there introduced me by saying, Francesco, this is your city. And as I was somewhat surprised and I was looking at him, he said, look, I'll explain this to you. Ten years ago, I listened to you giving a lecture and you convinced me because it's been 10 years and we've been working with my team and with my co-workers for this city to be as similar as possible to what you are proposing. And in order to explain things, he was talking about a change of priorities. Usually, when you uh, present a project of this kind, which is something but that I wasn't presenting that day, but it's something that I do from time to time. But the mayors and the politicians grab me by the arm and say, Oh, Francesco, I love this. I'm totally in agreement with you. But uh, give me a couple of years to solve the traffic problem and then we'll get cracking. So two years went by and the traffic problem was not solved because it's impossible to solve, but the spaces and the resources, the economic resources and so on and so forth, were spent. So what uh, he said is that I'm very sorry. But what I was proposing is that we change the priorities. Instead of starting off with the cars and with the traffic, let's start off with the pedestrians. But why? Well, because of an issue of democracy, if we do believe in democracy, of course, because we are all pedestrians. and. Some uh, ride bicycles, and some of them uh, ride on the buses, and some of them uh, drive their own cars, but we are all pedestrians. So firstly, we have to think about the pedestrians, and that means that we're thinking about everybody, all citizens. An important um, element, uh, there are an important number of citizens in a city that do not drive, and it's possibly more than half the population. So thinking about uh, the city, but starting off with cars, I believe is a very strange choice, which is uh, completely unrelated or hardly related to democracy. And when they uh, considered this issue, they they said, well, what's happening in Pontevedra? Uh, in, in a nine-meter street, there are six uh, meters for cars, two lanes, and parking space. Unfortunately, there's only 1.5 meter on one side and 1.5 meters on the other side for pedestrians. And with the urban furniture, they have less than half a meter each, which means that the city of Pontevedra was suggesting that everybody walk in a single line, which means that you can't go out for a walk. At least for me, which for a walk, people abreast, at least. And he said, well, let's see what happens if we were to change the priorities. And let's start off with the pedestrians. So. And they said, well, here in Pontevedra, we need two people to be able to walk alongside each other with their umbrellas open. And this was the basic rule of town planning actions. It was two and a half meters uh, plus half a meter uh, for the urban elements, the urban furniture, three plus three, six. Fortunately, the cars were left with only three meters and only one lane, one way, and no parking spaces. So the parking spaces were going to be eliminated, a city with 80,000 inhabitants. And the parking spaces were removed and were taken outside. And um, the park and ride system was uh, designed. You can find this on the internet. And it's uh, like a metro map, a metro map of the city with different colors, where the different well, the distances from one place to another in minutes uh, walking to demonstrate that if we leave the car in one of the car parks, as some of them are free of charge, 
and peripheral inlets, then 15 minutes it will be possible to go anywhere. And then what I said is that it was a shame, it was terrible how the administration and how the designers and how the architects were solving the issue of the architectural barriers with ramps. Because those that are disabled have to make a much bigger go up or down the slope. And the same thing applies to elderly people, to senior citizens, people that use a walking stick. Climb or walk down a slope. And it's very difficult, but why? Because it never changes, well, the cars are the cars, because cars have an engine. And he proposed that a change be made in such a manner that path for the pedestrians be completely flat so that there be no interruptions for instance uh, with the so it's the cars that cross the pavement to enter a car park so that meant that the pavements cross the street and it's the cars that have to go up and the pavement is completely level. But if you nowadays go to Pontevedra, if you drive there, this is how you have to drive, up and down, up and down, because uh, all of these are flush with the pavements. And this has made it possible to reduce the speed of cars to 30 kilometers an hour. And the and I'm really, this is a bit uh, of propaganda, but the elections already took place, so this is not my intention. But as he's a doctor, he said that we have this issue, and what we have noticed is that in the uh, opinion polls, that at 50 kilometers an hour, which is what you get in Italy, mm, pedestrian out of every two dies because of an accident. At 30 kilometers an hour, it's uh, one out of 20 pedestrians that die. And does this have any kind of connection with democracy? I think so. Well, I'm going to uh, end with one final reflection. We do not allow children to go out on their own to the street because we believe that streets are dangerous. But I firmly believe that streets are dangerous because there are no kids on the streets. And... Kids on the streets oblige us to take charge of them. We have to look after them. We have to create a safe environment. And I'm going to finish with this, with this little uh, vignette that says, uh, please excuse the bother, but we are playing for you. Thank you very much.